Hey friends, and welcome to A Roomy Place. In this video, I wanted to talk about my favorite art books. In the YouTube world, I'm most well known for art, or I guess teaching about art. <laughs> and a lot of the ways that I've learned how to do art uh, has been influenced by a couple key books. So I raided my library and picked out the books that uh, have most influenced my art knowledge and art process, and I stacked them up here, and I'm going to talk about them with you in this video. So starting off with my favorite books, um, I wanted to begin with Alla Prima by Richard Schmid, or I guess this is Alla Prima 2, which is the updated version of his prior book. Richard Schmidt is um, a unicorn <laughs> in a lot of ways. You know, a lot of people that are really good at painting are not necessarily good at teaching painting, right? Those are like two totally different skills in, in all forms of art. You know, you can have someone who's just a, a genius at making something, but they can't necessarily transmit like how to do that to somebody else. Richard Schmidt is really, really good at painting and he's really good at teaching about painting. So this this book was really amazing and formative to me for that reason because here we've got somebody who's pretty good at doing both of those things. Richard Schmidt's painting style is so subtle it's like intimate this guy's like intimate with paint that feels kind of gross to say <laughs> but he's got this thing where he just like he he knows what paint will do he knows what color will do and um he takes that into his his art and makes something that's just really really subtle <laughs> That's something that I really love about him is he's got this like subtlety and familiarity. And then on to his teaching gift. Um, Richard Schmidt is really good at making painting seem like a very simple thing. <laughs> right? And painting is not simple at all. But somehow um, this guy's put like together a kind of uh, conceptualization of how painting works that just um, g gives you something to go off of, right? So when, when you read Richard Schmid's books, you get this idea that, well, yeah, I guess in a sense, painting is just about accurate drawing and picking the right color and getting the edges correct, you know, if it should be sharp or blurry, and getting the lightness or darkness of a thing, um, and making a beautiful composition, right? Like, those those are all doable things. Those, those are something that you can kind of math out <laughs> a little bit and say, all right, well, this drawing's either right or it's wrong. And, um, yeah, I just think that is so liberating, right? That's... That's something that I guess got me into drawing and painting initially was realizing that um, whether whether or not I feel like I'm talented or gifted in art, like I can get better at this by like following the rules. And really that is my foundation in art. Like I don't feel like I'm talented in art in any respect, but um, I feel like I grokked onto the rules by teachers like Richard Schmid, and um, and I rolled with it. So I think that is awesome. One other thing that I really love about Richard Schmid is the way he talks. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. He's got this like folksy way of speaking. He uses he's a very lighthearted, um, jovial speaker who just. <laughs> he says phrases that you've never heard of before, probably because I guess he made it up. 
that is like so refreshing to me. And I think that speaks to his art genius is like, you know, he's got originality as an artist. And that originality is like bled into his way of speaking as well, right? Like originality is so core to him that um, he's he's a genius in painting, but he's a little bit of a genius in the way he talks too. <laughs> it's refreshing. There aren't too many people out there who like you know, really speak their own language, like their own choice of words. You know, like it's real common for us to just cobble on our ways of speaking and our phrases from just, you know, the community that we're in. You know, go to a church or go to a political rally and you'll see that turned up to 11, right? Everybody sounds the exact same. They're all saying the exact same thing. And Richard Schmid talks different. I'm moving on to my next favorite book. This is uh, this is just an art book by an artist named Kim Jung Gi, um, and I guess I'll need to blur out these boobies when I uh, put this up <laughs> on YouTube. But um, the thing I love about Kim Jung Gi in looking at his art is Kim Jung Gi is so good at drawing that he literally can just magically create things out of a blank page, right? If if you're experienced enough in the art world, like maybe you've seen videos of him doing this, um, it's like a whole show in and of itself. You, you can just watch Kim Jong-gi take a blank page and suddenly just pick a point on a person's body, like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe with this fine lady, he'll, he'll start with his knee right here. And then like from an arbitrary location he just builds out this like complex amazing accurate form it's like mind-boggling that's like life goals for me in art <laughs> and like i said i'm not really a very gifted artist when it comes down to it i'm pretty formulaic but like i see somebody do this and like, this is mega inspiring for me for for my own art practices. And frankly, like, I, I take this kind of, like, originality more into my own writing than I do in uh, art. Like, I don't draw from the imagination too much because, I don't know, it's just not as natural to me. It kind of hurts my head. <laughs> but, um, but I can write from my imagination. And people like Kim Jong-gi kind of, like, show me a way there of like a certain amount of free freedom just starting from nothing and making something that is beautiful through just obviously years and years of repeatedly practicing his thing so i love that Another favorite book on the list, this is Steve Houston's Figure Drawing for Artists. I do regular figure drawing, and I wouldn't say I learned figure drawing from books necessarily, but if there is a book and a teacher who, um, I guess maybe whose uh, structure and way of doing things most aligns with my my own figure drawing. Uh, Steve Houston's the guy. He, um, in this book and in, in video series that he's done, um, he's just got a really awesome way of like simplifying the human form and of conveying the fact that it's like a 3D thing. Steve Houston is really good at finding this balance, which maybe he even authored, of like getting the structure right, like the accuracy, and putting life into the drawing as well, right? Because if you're, if you're like super rigid, like if you're super fixated on getting an accurate drawing, the inevitable result is it's going to look real stiff, right? 
But if you're like too flowy and loosey goosey, then like you, you lose the form and it just, uh, I don't know. It, it isn't, it isn't believable as like a real thing. So that's like, I don't know, my interpretation of Steve Houston is like, that's his jam, is like finding this sweet spot of interrelating between the the yang of accuracy and the yin of putting life in a thing. And um, his drawings, I think, are really compelling for that reason. Um, it's totally believable as a figure, like everything's there, but um, there's still like energy somehow somehow energy has been like injected into a drawing that's like magic all right my next favorite book apparently doesn't even have words to it <laughs> and i'm not going to bury the lead here this is my most recent book um it's called how to write this book and uh i consider this an art book how to Write This Book um, was basically my story of how am I going to figure out how to write this book. <laughs> I was in a place where I was really burned out, like I just didn't have energy, but um, somehow I wanted to create something. And uh, so I figured like I would figure out how to be creative by creating. So in the end, this turned into um, a lovely book about creativity, and um, it's truly one of my favorite books, which I guess should be a goal as an author, right? You want to write something that um, you want to read, and in my book, that was a success because uh, I can still pick up this book and um, just eat it up. Moving on to something that... Um, I guess it, maybe it's questionable in some ways if this is an art book or not, but I consider it an art book. It's Ways of Seeing by John Berger. Seeing is a really interesting thing. If you think about like what it is to be an artist, like doesn't it ultimately come down to seeing good? <laughs> Maybe artists don't necessarily think about that too much, but really, it, in some ways, that's like kind of the core of art is learning how to see something. Personally, I'm not convinced that there's been a book written yet that really gets to the heart of that. I think the book's in me, maybe, and maybe eight books down the road or something, I'll have something to say about this subject. But... um I think in this book, John Berger opens my eyes, at least, to um, a little bit more of what seeing actually is, and how seeing, in some ways, is still kind of an open frontier. We've got very limited ways of seeing and engaging with the world, and somehow from reading this book, I... I caught on to a kind of sense that there are all kinds of other ways of seeing that um, perhaps have never even been done before. I think that's real fascinating. I know that's kind of an abstract way to talk, and uh, I'm sure I don't know how to make it more clear than that right now. But this is a real eye-opening book in that sense. And ostensibly, it's all about art, right? Like, this is a painting by Magritte right here. So... Uh, I guess it is about art too, in the sense that like most of what he's talking about is, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it like art criticism or something like that. All right, next we've got The Art Spirit by Robert Henry. This is like the art Bible, man. <laughs> Every time I pick up this book, um, I end up highlighting like <laughs> everything. <laughs> Every line, it's like, oh yeah, that's amazing. That's totally mind-blowing. Underline, underline, underline. And um, this book has that wonderful quality in books where like when you read it a second time, you, you pick up on like whole new things that had apparently just you totally missed the first time you read through it. It's a kind of book that grows with you as an artist. 
which I think is fitting for something which advertises itself as spirituality, right? Spirituality is kind of general in the sense that it has wide application over the specifics. So this is a real cool book. Um, I think he gets at the spiritual aspect of art in um, a very comprehensible way. One of my favorite ideas in this book, which I'm sure I've talked about in my art channel before, is the idea that um, your techniques, like the way that you do art, should ultimately come out of your own practice rather than the other way around. Does that make sense? Like, for example, say, say like I really liked Kim Jong-gi's artwork, right? And like, I, I want to, I want to draw like Kim Jong-gi. And so what I do is, you know, I study all of his techniques, um, and learn a how exactly to draw like Kim Jong-gi. Well, in the end, like the thing that I would have accomplished is learning really well how to mimic Kim Jong-gi, right? And maybe, maybe I could even surpass him in like my technical skill in the end. But in the end, what I've missed in that process is that Art shines most as a form of self-expression, right? That's like why we made art. It's self-expression. It's expressing something from your own spirit. And by practicing art um, in a way that's based on just collecting techniques and making them better, other people's techniques, and cobbling them into this, uh, you know, Frankenstein style that you think is really cool, um... You're missing, I think, like the heartbeat essence of what art is, which again, self-expression. So the way Robert Henry frames the alternative is you do your own practice, right? You do your own thing. You follow what interests you. You paint in a way that interests you. And the techniques and like the ways that you do the painting, those will just emerge out of your own practice. The analysts will look at it and say, oh, these are his or her techniques um, by which they make this art in the specific way they do. But those techniques were not prescriptive for you. They were just descriptive of the thing that you were actually doing the whole time, which was just doing your thing. All right, so I've gone back up and I've raided my library because I knew I had forgotten some real important ones. So the next book on the list is called Zen and Japanese Culture. And I know that probably sounds oddly specific, <laughs> but this is one of my favorite art books. Zen has a long history of association with creative practice. And one of the interesting things about Zen history is um, a lot of these Zen masters, after they had uh, you know, moments of insight or whatever, became like super duper creative afterwards. It's real interesting. So this book is about that, um, and a lot of the chapters are arranged in terms of, I guess you would say, art practices that are kind of um, special or unique to Japanese culture. So, you know, they got a whole chapter on uh, zen, the zen of sword fighting, the zen of serving tea really good, <laughs> uh, you know, stuff like that. In a similar vein, we've got The Zen of Creativity by John Dido Lurie. In general, I, I hate books that have this kind of preservation, uh, sorry, presentation, like cultivating your artistic life. That, um, <laughs> usually that comes off as so salesy to me. So I don't know why I actually bought this book. But um, it turns out that it, uh, 
he has some real interesting things to chew over. I don't know if I've really digested everything from this book yet, but in a similar vein to Zen and Japanese culture, and I, I think even with more personal specificity, um, John Dido Lori gets across some sense of like a practice that could connect you to the thing that you're making, right? So like, as a painter, I'm, um, I'm somebody who, you know, paints things and I'm looking at a reference while painting the thing. And what I think this book is starting to get across to me is that um, developing an intimacy with the reference and the reference painter there, there's a potential for like a greater and greater connection to the thing that you're looking at and painting, right? There, there's some kind of powerful intimacy that's available there. And he, he, I think, suggests to me like some other ways that that would be possible in this book. So yeah, just the kind of thing I find real interesting. And then finally, dun, 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 this is the goat the greatest of all time. Without a question, this is the most influential art book that I've ever read and probably ever will read. Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by Betty Edwards. This blessed woman um, got me into drawing in general. If it weren't for her, like uh, I would have stopped in high school and probably never picked it up again. What's really cool about this book is, just like the book that I started with, um, the uh, Richard Schmid book, Betty Edwards makes it simple. She takes away all the mystique, all the complexity, and what she suggests is that like drawing is a normal skill that everybody used to have. Right, suddenly it's just disappeared, and all of a sudden nobody can draw good no more. But like back in the day, like 150 years ago, everybody was a good drawer. And what she suggests is that's because they were they're drawing differently back then. And her whole, you know, I guess pitch is like drawing from the right side of the brain, which psychologically would be like. You know, if you get yourself, like, into a creative state, a flow state, you kind of shake off the rigidity of worry and um, correctness, and you just kind of do it, then all of a sudden, well, it turns out that drawing really isn't that hard at all. So she's got all these cool techniques for, um, for like, shaking you into the flow state. She'll, like, make you draw something upside down so you can't really tell what it is quite so well. She has you draw the negative shapes of stuff, all, all kinds of techniques. But um, by gosh, it, it actually worked. <laughs> I did it and like, I get it. Wow. Like drawing isn't hard. <laughs> it's just lines and angles. And like, if you have a working set of eyes and like a hand that, you know, is an average amount of steadiness, then um, there's no limit to the the skill as a draftsman that you can express, just as like, you know, you, you got the machinery for it, you know? <laughs> it's like a totally demystifying way of looking at art, right? It's like, okay, it's, it's simple. You just, you know, judge the angles, judge the distance, make the line, and... Um, it's crazy, man. She has you, uh, she has you like draw a face at the beginning and then at the end, and you can like compare the change. That's always like a real wow moment. And for me, one of one of the biggest wow moments is like early on in this book, she has you draw your own hand, and like your hand, that's like the definition of a hard thing to draw, right? Like look at all these dangly things going all over the place. Like, how am I going to draw that? Um, 
but by her technique of just just get into the flow state and look at it and like draw the angles you see don't draw the hand don't draw the fingers you're not drawing hands or fingers you're you're drawing this angle and you're you're judging if the angle you drew was like the angle that you see in the end you end up with like quote unquote photorealistic hand right like an accurate drawing of a hand even though that's the hardest thing that you could possibly draw so thank you betty edwards for um showing me that i can make art too all right, friends, so that's it. Those are my lists of my favorite and most influential books. I hope you enjoyed my video, and I hope you have a great day. Peace.